he really is one of the preeminent uh, people uh, in our field, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce him today to talk about the Fukushima disaster. Eric. Uh, th thanks, Mark. Thanks, thanks to all of you. Thanks particularly to Jane for uh, her, her endless prodding, despite my reluctance to first send a topic, uh, then to send an abstract, then to send a PowerPoint. Uh, she, she did not miss a beat. So uh, congratulations, Jane, for eliciting all of those responses. Um, I'm, I'm at the beginning of this project. I was, I was drafted, I guess, last April, May by a group of Japanese legal scholars who were funded by the Japan Foundation to try to figure out what it, what it is that we hadn't done but ought to have been doing in thinking about the area of law and disasters, both in Japan and more generally, uh, with an effort both to, to look back, uh, learn about other disasters, uh, look at Fukushima, try to figure out what's going on, and see whether we might learn something from these problems that would help us somewhat proactively in the future. Uh, I've spent some but not enough time on the ground uh, in Japan digging into this topic. My, my hunch and hope is that some of you have a good deal of knowledge that will help me fill some of the gaps and, and give me a way forward. Uh, but it's really since last March, and I, and I suppose Mark is right, I, I, um, I never quite thought about my work thriving on disasters, but uh, both from my teaching of torts and from my research interests, it, it's almost always a combination of, of interesting legal issues and some degree of human suffering that, that uh, sparks my interest. And so the, the interest sparked around the Fukushima case for me of the many issues obviously one could be looking at is what is it that the government would do in Japan with regard to taking care of the victims of the disaster? Would there be a compensation scheme? What would it look like? Were we going to see a 9-11 type case, uh, there we are, was, 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 were we going to see a 9-11 type response, the government saying this is a unique tragedy, a disaster that demands a response that shows the social solidarity of the Japanese people, uh, or were we going to see something else or nothing? Uh, and what I found so far at least, and again very tentative, is, is that in, in many critical ways uh, the response to Fukushima has been just like the response to a range of other disasters uh, for many years in Japan. So despite the, the, the many claims about this being a unique and devastating, unprecedented tragedy in Japan, uh, one doesn't see, yet at least, much difference with regard to how the government is dealing with the victims of the tragedy. Um, historically, when it comes to natural disasters and a range of man-made disasters, uh, you, you find few, if any, examples of the state stepping in a la 9-11 and saying, this is terrible, we collectively owe something to the victims, let's take care of them. Where you see compensation, it's almost always the result of social movements using litigation to target the state, to press for compensation, and in many cases, uh, you see compensation that's generated from pub private money rather than public money. Um, at any rate, I'm gonna, I want to share with you as many of the details as I can uh, about how the Fukushima compensation scheme is working so far. Uh, but before I do that, I want to step back a little bit and provide some contexts. Lots of disasters to choose from, so uh, don't, don't think I get them all. Uh, but just a, a few sort of post-war highlights in, in, in the uh, natural disaster area in Japan. The, whoops, and I think I skipped one somehow. Oh, I see. So the left arrow, this, this is very counterintuitive. <laughs> These are, there we go. The right arrow goes left, the left arrow goes right. So I guess this is like driving in Japan, this keyboard. <laughs> so I will try to go forward. If I start going off the, trail, the rails here, please let me know. Uh, so the, the Isawan Typhoon, uh, up until uh, the 1950s, said to be the worst natural disaster in Japan's history, 5,000 dead, 40,000 injured, many homes destroyed. Obviously a reconstruction effort by the government, that's the case in uh, almost every circumstance of natural disaster. You have the state that steps in to rebuild roads and such, but no money at all channeled to the victims of this disaster to help, for example, with property loss, to help with personal injury, uh, emotional distress, 
uh, taking care of families where someone in the home was killed. Uh, the key response was the Disaster Countermeasures Basic Act. You can see the, 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 the main thrust of that, none of it having to do with uh, compensation in terms of personal injury and personal loss. Uh, the Okshidi earthquake and tsunami. Fortunately, uh, the main effect was a relatively small island, so while the island was devastated, the number of victims was relatively modest. It was at that point in 1993, the biggest Jap earthquake in Japan for 25 years. Uh, donations after the earthquake were collected throughout Japan. So the state didn't step in and say, we've got a small number of people who were at the brunt of a major tragedy, let's take care of them. Uh, instead, private money collected around the country uh, provided to the families. Uh, the Kobe earthquake, uh, most recent, obviously, in our memories. Uh, 6,000 dead, 40,000 injured, almost half a million homes lost. Uh, the government turned back to the 1961 uh, Disaster Act and used it as a way to speed up the insurance company payments uh, enabled people to delay paying their taxes, etc. cetera. Uh, but no government money focused on compensating individuals for personal harms. The Japanese Red Cross collected donations throughout the country. They funneled some money to the victims. In the reconstruction budget of 1995, the diet included a little bit of money for what they called condolence money, which is really sharply distinguished from compensation and an, an issue I'd like to spend a little bit more time looking at because the language of payment turns out to be uh, rather important here. But again, no broad-based compensation. Uh, there. Floods. Maybe somebody here knows about floods. I'm told by a couple of folks in Japan that they're pretty sure at some point, if I really dig into the literature on floods in Japan, I may find some examples of the government stepping in and voluntarily offering compensation payments. I haven't done it. I don't yet know. Uh, outside the natural disaster area, you know, Minamata always comes to mind as an example of state compensation. But again, there, of course, it's worth remembering, A, the, the, the quite uh, vicious fight early on about Minamata, where the money offered was condolence money, not compensation, and the amounts were quite low. And the development of a compensation fund uh, was, uh, at, at least in the tellings of, of scholars who have looked at this, really largely the result of social movements and litigation, not a, not a sign of social solidarity or, or uh, state largesse to the victims. Uh, HIV blood, really very similar, huge number, or huge percentage at least, of Japanese hemophiliacs contaminated with HIV through the blood supply. Uh, one often reads how generously they were compensated, but of course the compensation they received was uh, almost entirely the result, I'd say entirely the result, of litigation in Tokyo and Osaka and a brokered settlement uh, by the judges in those cases. Uh, Terrorism, one might think, uh, better analogy, better comparison to 9-11. Maybe in instances of terrorism, you find the government stepping in and saying, look, we're all in this together. We'll take care of individuals who were harmed. Uh, the, the abduction issue, I suppose, is the closest one I could find. There is an, a law that was passed uh, in 2002 that provides monthly stipends. Uh, to the families and individuals who were repatriated to Japan. Uh, whoops, too fast. Uh, but, but of course, the numbers here are tiny, right? We're, we're talking about five families who are receiving this money, only 17 recognized cases, five receiving money, and a heavy dose of politics after the uh, visit of Prime Minister Koizumi to North Korea that led to the passage of this law. Uh, closer yet, perhaps, to 9-11, the uh, sarin gas attacks in the subways. The claim here, the demand of the victims for compensation, went to uh, the cult itself through litigation. They won a 3.8 billion yen judgment against the cult, uh, pretty clearly not uh, 
a judgment that was going to be satisfied because the cultists didn't have that much money. When the cult ran out of money, the government stepped in and made up a good deal of the deficit and ended up uh, having a fairly significant debate about whether Japan should, like Israel and a number of other countries, develop a fund that would, regular, that would be a regular fund for individuals who are victims of terrorist attacks in Japan. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether the result was simply a stalemate or a clear no, but no such fund was developed. Uh, the, the, the only and, and best predecessor to Fukushima is the accident in Tokai Mura in 1999, where you had a few workers exposed to high levels of radiation, a few hundred residents exposed, and 300,000 people who were told to stay inside for a while and in, until the, uh, the dust settled, so to speak. This was the first and only accident so far in Japan to trigger the uh, 1961 Nuclear Damage Compensation Act. The individuals here claimed that they had uh, an entitlement to compensation because the government had in 1961, as part of developing nuclear power in Japan and convincing local governments and local citizens to accept the siting of plants in their neighborhoods, developed a scheme for compensating people in the event of an accident. Uh, the scheme required that the uh, providers of energy insure up to a certain amount. In 1961, that amount was 1 billion yen. So you were told as a provider or, a, or an owner of a nuclear power plant that you needed to have a billion yen of insurance uh, in the event of an accident. That has now been pumped up. Uh, the last time the law was revised was 2009. And the requirement now is that uh, the power companies hold 120 billion yen uh, in insurance, and, and I'll come back to that because that turns out to be an, an important uh, issue in the Fukushima scheme. Uh, so what, what, what happened in this case was uh, that about 7,000 claims ultimately were raised by citizens and local businesses, people claiming that they'd been harmed or lost money in some ways as a result of this accident. And uh, they were paid, though they weren't paid directly, they were paid by the parent company of Tokai Muda, which is a, a, uh, a Mitsubishi-owned company. Mitsubishi said it really had no legal responsibility to step in and cover the costs, but they were going to step in and cover the costs anyway because it was the right thing to do, and after all, it wasn't all that expensive in the end. It was about 13 billion uh, yen that were expended. Um, looking back, it's clear that one of the issues to have emerged here was that the Nuclear Damage Compensation Act had little, almost nothing to say about what compensation meant in the event of a nuclear uh, accident. Didn't say who was entitled to money for what they'd be entitled to money. Uh, all of the details were left vague. So a committee was established uh, right after this accident to start hammering out the categories. And it's those categories to which uh, the Fukushima uh, compensators have returned. Uh, so, so the background of Fukushima is a background in which the payment of compensation to individuals harmed as a result of nuclear accidents, natural disasters, terrorism, medical, bloodborne, environmental tragedies uh, is, is a norm of no compensation. A, a very nice book by David Eddington a couple of years ago about the Kobe earthquake in which he says the view in Japan is that the government can't help people to reconstruct their lives. Instead, the norm is that, quote, all people should be treated equally in the provision of government services and support, i.e., it would be unfair, in unequitable, unequal to compensate victims of certain kinds of disasters because, after all, uh, bad things happen to good people all of the time that go uncompensated. That's what much of the civil law uh, and tort law is about. So Fukushima's background is, is, is very much a norm of you know, no expectation of particular compensation. Um, so the, the questions and, and the way I want to organize the, the description of, of, of Fukushima, I think is, is an organization uh, that 
that will work for the broader purposes that I'll, that I'll end up using this study for, which is to put it in a comparative framework. Because I, I think the, these are the things one wants to know when looking at a compensation scheme. And I'll, and I'll go through each one of them, but let me just highlight them first. Uh, no, number one, who's eligible? Right? You have an accident, you have people who, who both perceive themselves as and are perceived to be victims. Which of the uh, individuals claiming to be affected by this particular accident are eligible for compensation? How do you identify uh, the individuals and groups? Uh, B, overlapping but I think distinct is what are they eligible for? Uh, what range of harms is it that an eligible claimant might be paid for. What counts as compensable? What counts as outside the boundaries of, of compensability? Third, for those who are both uh, legitimate claimants and have eligible claims, what is it that they're going to need to show or prove to demonstrate that the, what they're suffering was actually uh, causally linked to the, to the accident that occurred? And how do they establish the magnitude of the loss? You're saying you lost wages? Well, how do we know how much you made, what your work was, uh, how frequently you worked, et cetera? Uh, fourth is infrastructure. Co compensation is, is a really institutionally complicated uh, story. So it, it, it's not just that you decide people are eligible and you know, they have fruit. Where do they file? Who creates the paperwork? Who keeps track of it? How do you make sure that people in, who are similarly situated, you know, the neighbors who suffered virtually identical harms, get the same amount of money? Uh, who's cutting the checks? Who's watching the budget? Who's hiring and firing the people doing this? Who's making sure the money's not getting ripped off? Uh, so the infrastructure is, is very complicated here. And fifth is, is claimant obligations. People are getting something valuable in compensation. Uh, for accidents they suffer. And the question is, what, if anything, are they required to do or give up? Can they take your compensation money and sue? Uh, what other obligations might claimants have? Um, so defining eligibility, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through each of these five. Uh, you know, sometimes it's easy, or, or at least it's mechanical. So if, if you think back to the 9-11 compensation fund, Congress said to the special master in its legislation, uh, you know, your job is to compensate those who were you know, directly affected. I can't remember the exact enabling legislation. And so the special master there, Ken Feinberg, we'll come back to him at some point, had to decide who was in proximity to the 9-11 uh, the accident and who wasn't. And of course, you know, you get claims from New Jersey, people watching the planes from uptown, from people watching television and seeing these horrible images. And he said, you know what? This is going to be easy. Here's a map of Manhattan. This way, this way, this way, this way. Nice square streets. If you're inside that zone, you're eligible. If you're outside, you're not. That's the end of it. If you were five blocks too far uptown than my eligibility zone, you don't have a claim here. You can sue. You can do other things. But you're out. The Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that, that we all have been watching for the last couple of years, obviously much more complicated. Claims have come in to the, uh, to, to the compensation group there from all 50 states and I think 35 countries. That's not a neat square, right? I mean, th there your pool of eligibility from the claimant's perspective is the entire globe. And one of the most difficult jobs the special master had there was figuring out which, in, not, which, not which substantive claims were in initially, but which individuals, which institutions, which businesses had a claim at all. Um, so the first big question in Fukushima was, look, the, you know, the, the, the fact is that the vast majority of people who suffered in that region did not suffer as a result of the, of the nuclear accident, right? You've got 20,000 people almost dead or missing, a million homes fully or partially destroyed, um, well over 100,000 people displaced. Only some of those were the result of the nuclear meltdown. Almost none of the deaths were the result of the nuclear meltdown. So for, first going in decision, do you compensate everybody up there? Do you just compensate the people 
who were harmed from one piece of this accident? And how do you disentangle this multi-causal, triple disaster? Uh, and the answer there is, is, a, is a mix of pragmatism and policy. Uh, the pragmatism is, uh, it's not clear the Japanese government, or maybe it is clear, the Japanese government doesn't have enough money to compensate everybody uh, in, in a sufficient way. I mean, if you're, you're talking about millions of people who would have a claim to compensation, and there I think the government throws up his arms and says, like, we don't have, even have to think about whether it's the right thing or not to do. We can't afford it, unless we're going to give everybody a hundred bucks and say we're sorry and this is symbolic. Uh, and, and no one suggested that that was a good idea. And interestingly in Japan, a, at least in the, in the limited circles in which I travel, uh, you find few, if any, claims from families or individuals who suffered as a result of the earthquake and tsunami that they ought to be receiving the same kind of compensation that's being received by the victims of the nuclear meltdown. Uh, it was interesting to me, going, going back to the HIV blood work I did, I heard regularly in the US, for example, from non-hemophiliacs infected with HIV that, that gay men, for example, said, it's not fair. Why should the hemophiliacs infected through the blood supply be compensated? Those of us who are infected as a result of of sexual relations, we're similarly innocent. We all ought to be compensated. Uh, we're all in the same boat. So far, uh, maybe perha perhaps some of you have heard it, I haven't heard that type of claim there. Uh, the, the policy claim is that there's specific legislation in Japan, as I mentioned earlier with regard to Tokaimura, that requires that utility companies compensate in the case of a disaster. So the compensation scheme that's now unfolding in Fukushima has nothing at all to do with government, uh, with social solidarity, with the government that says, we owe it to these individuals. It's, it's purely a consequence of 1961 legislation that got nuclear power off and running in Japan. Um, the act is complicated, and, and so I want to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about it. Uh, the, comp the, the, the Nuclear Damage Compensation Act has a couple of clauses in it that have been controversial. The first one is, it says that operators of nuclear power facilities are, have strict and unlimited liability. All that, that, that's legalese for saying it doesn't matter whether they acted carelessly or not. You don't need to show that they were negligent. You don't need to show they did anything wrong. They could have acted with extraordinary prudence. Doesn't matter. They still pay. And they pay for everything. So they're responsible for the full costs of an accident they cause unless the nuclear accident was the result of a grave natural disaster. And TEPCO was real fast to say this was a grave natural disaster. Uh, but of course, it's the government who gets to make that decision. And they said, you know, this was really bad, but it's not unprecedented. You know, after all, there was a similar tsunami there just a thousand years ago. So, you know, and we have it in the record and people have spoken about it. So, uh, you know, TEPCO tried to s just step to the side and say, terrible problem, not our problem, certainly not our legal responsibility. And the government said, you know, nothing doing. You guys are on the hook. So sort of fight one was whether TEPCO was on the hook at all. Uh, question two is, all right, TEPCO is required by this law to cover the first 120 billion yen of an accident in two ways. A, they've got to buy insurance. B, they have to enter into an agreement with the government that if for some reason the insurance coverage doesn't cover the cost of the accident, the government will. Uh, well, it turns out if you, you have to start sort of digging through laws, there's another uh, extraordinarily scintillating bit of reading called the Act on Indemnity Agreements for Compensation of Nuclear Damage. Uh, but embedded in there is a clause that says if a nuclear accident is the result of an earthquake, a tsunami, a flood, then the insurance coverage does not hold. That means that the 120 billion yen is covered through this indemnity agreement with the government. So, so the first 120 billion turned out to be, you know, not easy, but at least 
if you look carefully at the law, you kind of figure out where that's coming from. But there's a problem in Fukushima, which is that the estimates with regard to the compensation costs run somewhere between 2 and 40 trillion yen at the moment. And this is an example of where you can make up any number you want, and you're just as right as the other person. Because nobody has any idea what the compensation costs are ultimately going to be, because the key categories for which people are claiming compensation remain unresolved. And we'll get to those. Turns out the law has almost nothing to say about what happens in the event that an accident costs more than 120 billion yen. It says legally TEPCO here is on the hook. Again, doesn't matter if they did anything wrong. They're responsible for covering all the costs. But it's obvious TEPCO doesn't have the money. So clause, an, another clause says, you know, but if the government thinks it's a good idea in the circumstances, the government can step in and cover the costs. So the compensation scheme that you're seeing in the money flowing right now is money that largely emanates from the government through a variety of financing mechanisms, loans and bond sales and all sorts of other stuff, gets, uh, to, to, to put a not very generous spin on it, laundered through TEPCO and then paid out to the victims in Fukushima. The government says, of course, it's not really government money. TEPCO is going to pay it all back. But exactly how TEPCO is going to pay it all back, I mean, it is the fourth largest or was the fourth largest utility company in the world. Uh, but it's, you know, you, you, you get into the multi-trillions and, and, and pay back, particularly when the government is saying, well, you can't raise rates that much. That wouldn't be a good thing to do. Well, it's not clear where else TEPCO is going to get that money. So let TEPCO go bankrupt. Many people in Tokyo are saying, you know, let, let them die. Many of the victims are saying, let TEPCO die. You know, they, it was their fault, even though fault's not an issue in the legislation. Government shouldn't prop them up. But the government seems to have absolutely no ap appetite for letting TEPCO go bankrupt, in part because TEPCO is a very nice buffer, right? If the norm is the state doesn't want responsibility and doesn't want to assert responsibility for taking care of the victims, then what you don't want to be is the state processing the claims and paying people. You're much happier having the money go through TEPCO. Um, the government, I suppose, could say, well, TEPCO's bankrupt and we're not responsible, so we're not going to pay. But that would not be a wise political move for a variety of reasons. And, and it appears that there's a good deal of non-Japanese money, foreign investment money, connected to TEPCO. And the government is certainly not keen to uh, throw yet another shadow over the investment climate in Japan. So, so TEPCO remains uh, the money uh, as it is flows. Uh, I put this here just because when I see this many arrows, it, it just tells me something is very messy and confused about what's going on here. This is the official translation. Uh, and the Japanese version looks identical, just the, uh, the, the characters are different, obviously. For where the money's flowing and who's responsible for compensation. Uh, I, so I, mean, I could keep that up there for the next 20 minutes and give a prize to anyone who could really figure it out. Uh, I could tell you no one working on this system has figured it out. Um, all of that, all of that's a response to the big question of, you know, the big sort of lumpy question. Do people who were harmed by the earthquake, by the tsunami, by the uh, nuclear meltdown get money? And, and, and why or why not? And where's the money coming from? Uh, but, but then you get the more nitty gritty issues. Uh, which particular individuals and concerns harmed by the radiation, harmed by the meltdown, have an entitlement, have a legitimate claim to compensation here? And, and again, you see some, some of the numbers, 100,000 refugees, 150,000 people uh, out of work, et cetera. Government appoints a committee uh, that issues a set of guidelines in August. And the first cut determination on who gets compensation is, is uh, largely the following. If, if we, the government, forced you either to do something or didn't allow you to do something, and that cost you money, we'll pay. If we forced you to move out of your house and go somewhere, then we'll pay some of your costs. If we didn't let you sell your crops, 
we'll cover you. If we, if we prohibited you from fishing, if we didn't let you fly, et cetera. Um, so the limiting principle fundamentally was whether or not uh, people were or were not subject to some form of government mandate. Uh, the immediate fight at a fight that took a while to resolve was what about, right, if you remember the, the, the circles around the Fukushima plants, 20 kilometers, 20 to 30 kilometers beyond, there was the zone where you had to evacuate. Then there was the zone where you were, where you were told you better be ready to evacuate. You can voluntarily evacuate, but we're not going to force you. Well, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of those folks got out of there, particularly families with kids and pregnant women, et cetera. And the government's initial guidelines said none of you get compensated because you didn't have to go. You chose to go. Why should you be compensated for your own choices? And, of course, it's not really the government saying this. It's a government-appointed committee, but it's TEPCO, the power company, that retains control over the decisions. There's just, you know, there's a fancy committee suggesting guidelines, but TEPCO's largely free to do what it pleases. Um, so the categories of the compensable, what, what, what is it that people can be compensated for? What are the range of harms? And, and it's, it, 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 it's a law school hypothetical. It's approximate cause issue. It's a look, you know, you, you bang into a tree with your car and, and the tree falls and, and kills somebody and that somebody's spouse has a breakdown and their breakdown cause, like which, which of the people in this long, messy, complicated situation have a claim to compensation and which ones have experienced harms that are sufficiently attenuated that it's legitimate to say, no, 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 you're outside the circle uh, that we think of as reasonable. Uh, it's a set of questions that, that, that haunts folks uh, in, in the civil law world uh, or, or you know, in the civil law field in Japan and Germany, et cetera. There's a range of different ways in which different legal systems try to work those thorny issues out, but none of us have done a terrific job at it. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, Deepwater Horizon, the Gulf oil spill case, uh, a claim comes from somebody who makes rope in Bergen, Norway. And the rope maker says, I make rope, I sell all of my rope to the fisher, uh, the fishing industry in the Gulf. The fishing industry is now dead in the Gulf. I'm not selling any rope. Do they get compensated? Do they net not get compensated? Are they too far away somehow, or are they sufficiently close? You can imagine the wide range of harms connected to the Fukushima nuclear accident for which people are claiming that they are deserving of compensation, an almost unlimited number of harms. And uh, so, so I want to highlight the ones that have been most uh, germane. Uh, emotional distress, right? It's fairly clear, I think, even though there are huge unknowns in terms of long-term exposure to low levels of radiation, what the health consequences are. Uh, all of the experts to date have suggested that the number of additional cancers from this are going to be relatively modest in the single-digit thousands, not the double-digit thousands, and perhaps as low as one or two thousand are the estimates I've seen most recently. But emotional harms are huge. People are freaked out about radiation exposure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of you who have friends and family in Japan uh, have the same stories I could tell about people who are leaving the country, living elsewhere, buying foods in new ways, uh, worried about school lunches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so a huge value uh, in worrying about emotional harms and who's entitled and how much they're entitled to. And for the individuals who have been evacuated, it is for most of them their single most significant source of uh, financing right now is the money they're receiving for the emotional harms they claim to have suffered. It's a flat amount, and the simple story is anyone who puts in a claim for emotional harms who was evacuated will receive 100,000 yen a month, uh, and that was supposed to shrink to 50,000 a month and then be recalculated. But the reality now is that individuals are getting 100,000 yen a month for their emotional harms. Uh, 
unless they were voluntary evacuees, and those who voluntarily evacuate get less. They get an 80,000 yen lump payment, or if they are children or pregnant women, they get 400,000 yen, but not ongoing payments. So clearly segmented treatment between the forced and the voluntary evacuees. Uh, but as of two months ago, the voluntary evacuees were brought into the fold. Property damage. Uh, here's why you can guess that the uh, compensation may cost two trillion and may cost uh, 20 trillion. What do you do about those whose homes are not inhabitable for the next five plus years, those people whose homes were really close into the reactors. What do you do about those people whose homes are probably habitable between a year and five years from now, but we're not quite sure yet? What do you do about people whose homes were blanketed by modest amounts of radiation, and the government says, it's safe, it's fine. Our standards say uh, this poses no long-term health risks. And the people say, I'm not going back there. And I'm not going back there because you were the cause of my harm. Doesn't matter whether it's your fault or not. You're legally responsible. I want to move to you know, Osaka. I want to move to Shikoku. I want to move anywhere but here. And so the, 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 the issue that's brewing is, you know, Maybe the government feels like, or TEPCO feels, that it ought to be buying people out of their homes if they're living so close to the reactors that for five or more years they're not going to be able to go home. But if you do that, how much do you pay? How do you value the homes and property, right? They're valueless at the moment. Do you go back to tax records? Do you, what, what's the market for this? Who owns them? Because TEPCO, I think, has made quite clear that even if they're going to compensate people for their homes, the last thing they want is to own those homes. They're not in the real estate business. They're not in the decontamination business. And these homes are going to do nothing but cost them more money. Uh, but you know, I, th I think there was a gesture at some point to give them to local government. And fortunately, local government was clever enough to say, you know, that, that's a hot potato we're not very interested in either. So. Uh, and, and then you have this, this kind of novel Sunfield Golf Club lawsuit uh, where they brought a claim saying that TEPCO was responsible for covering the cost of decontamination. And I've not, I've not read through the court documents here, but it seems that the response from TEPCO was, we don't own the radiation anymore. Like the, the radiation left our plant. It's now on your property, so you own it, and therefore we don't have to pay to clean it up. And the court was more sympathetic to that than one would have thought reasonable, because it's a kind of loopy claim. Uh, but worries, a lot of worries, about the costs of uh, property here. Farmers, I think, uh, almost unreported in the media, I think there's probably, as a group, more money that's been moved uh, to agriculture here than any other single group. Uh, and, and again, part of it's politics. Obviously, the, the Nokia, the Japanese uh, uh, agricultural cooperatives have long been uh, important politically in Tokyo. Uh, they're also well organized, and they also hired a very shrewd private attorney in Tokyo who pretty much, when I said to him, man, you're, you know, you're being really effective and aggressive in, in doing this, he's collected at this point almost a billion and a half dollars for the farmers, and that's an initial provisional payment. There's lots more behind that. Uh, he said, well, it's pretty clear to me there's never going to be enough money to cover all the harms. And so my job for my clients is to get in there first and negotiate aggressively and get them everything I can get. And so the farmers, so far, are doing reasonably well. Uh, the, the, the fisheries, at least to the best of my knowledge, not nearly as well. Uh, a range of, of tourist businesses. Oops, something disappeared here. Uh, I think I went over that already. A, a range of tourist businesses, the, the many hotels, for example, that say, look, we're, we're suffering. No one's coming to the hot springs. There, the rules have been very tough. So, for example, if you had a full plate of reservations and people called and canceled, you could get compensated. But if people stopped calling and weren't making reservations, you couldn't get compensated. So cancellations counted. Lack of, of, of biz, new business uh, didn't count.
Uh, Long-term health consequences, as I mentioned earlier, a, a great unknown. And how to handle that? How to handle the fact that we know that a couple of thousand people, say, will end up with cancers they wouldn't have otherwise had, but almost impossible to identify who those people are. Uh, and so you know, you're undercompensating. TEPCO is paying too little if they're not paying anything to those who have cancer but wouldn't have otherwise. But you know, no one has quite figured out how to handle that. Proof, what do you need to show? And I'm going to try to zip through the, the rest of this. Uh, you know, Gulf oil spill, you have fishermen coming saying, I lost $50,000 of income last year. Special master says, prove it. They say, here's my fishing license. Fishing license doesn't have income, doesn't tell you anything. Uh, but a lot of people don't have documentation. So what do you do about people in Fukushima who say, I've got lost income of such and such. I was in business with myself. I didn't use an accountant. And the city tax records are washed away and all of my own records are washed away. And in this area, like many other areas of the Fukushima compensation scheme, you see TEPCO and the compensators uh, staying very close to civil law principles. So, so they're, they're not inventing new ways in which and generous ways in which people can show their losses. They're pretty much uh, importing civil law concepts uh, with the sort of gloss of the committee who's creating the guidelines here, telling TEPCO to be practical and use common sense as if anybody knows what that means. Uh, infrastructure is the biggest and most controversial issue here. How do you, how do you structure the payment of compensation? Uh, there are about 10, well, there, there are about 10,000 people working for TEPCO now. 3,000 TEPCO employees, 7,000 temps, a couple hundred lawyers involved in the direct compensation efforts that TEPCO has brought to bear. Uh, but it turns out there are three ways that individuals can receive money here. So there's, there's three roads all to the same place if you think you have a legitimate compensation claim. You can, what, you can do what's called direct negotiation, that is, go directly to TEPCO, fill out their 32-page claim form, used to be 60, so this is an improvement, and say, here's what I think I'm entitled to. I've gone through your form. I've checked all the boxes. Uh, pay up. Uh, but So direct. There's what's called ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, an interesting misnomer because ADR uh, is almost always used to describe alternatives to litigation. But here, the ADR is an alternative to an alternative to litigation. Uh, so so the, there, there's two ADRs. Uh, and, and ADR was intended to be for those who didn't fit neatly into the guidelines. And so when they went to fill out this long claim form, they weren't finding the right boxes to check. So, so they would go through that route. And then, of course, there's the possibility of litigation. Uh, but it, it, it turns out there's very little litigation. There's in a quickly increasing amount of ADR. There's, there's about 1,300 cases of ADR pending. There's two to 300 new cases of ADR every month now. There's only about 200 lawyers who have been brought into the ADR system. The initial effort was to have three lawyers per ADR session and create a kind of a legal panel. Uh, but they don't have the personnel. So there's one lawyer. They were supposed to take three months each, the cases. They're taking significantly longer. So you, you, you have you know, the main route to TEPCO, which has compensated the bulk of individuals who have received compensation so far, about 25,000, but still a huge number of individuals who haven't applied. Um, you have ADR, which is terribly understaffed. And you have litigation that's extremely slow and expensive. Uh, hovering behind those is the fact that the lawyers in Tokyo and Fukushima are, are just at each other's throats over how to best represent the individuals involved in these cases. Fukushima lawyers say we've got it all under control. There's 70 of us up here. There's only a couple hundred thousand potential claimants after all. We're in our offices. The phones aren't ringing. Everybody who wants legal support is getting it. 
The Tokyo lawyers are saying you've got to go out to the shelters, you've got to reach out to clients, you have people in need who are depressed, who are uh, frustrated, uh, and in order for the Tokyo lawyers to be up in Fukushima representing the victims, they need the assent of the Fukushima Bar Association, and the Bar Association has said get lost. And, and so you have a, a really interesting uh, but, tr but, but unfortunate conflict within the legal profession itself over what constitutes good lawyering and, and appropriate behavior here. You also have a compensator, TEPCO, that can't afford yet lump sum payments. Uh, what people would really like here is one big check, goodbye, see you later, we're done, I'm going to go start a new life. What they're getting instead is, here's a couple of months of money, here's another temporary payment, we'll give you a little more here. The claim is the Fukushima disaster is still an unfolding problem, and so with, since, since it hasn't ended, you can't get a final payment. Uh, but underlying that is the fact that uh, lump sum payments are real expensive, and you have to decide what you're going to pay for. And they haven't figured out how to deal with either of that. They don't have enough money to pay, and they don't know what they're paying for yet. So what you end up with is rapidly escalating administrative costs. You have this infrastructure of 10,000 plus people, and you're going to have them for a while because the payments are continuing and continuing. Lastly, claimant responsibility. In most cases in the states that have been run, uh, by Special Master Ken Feinberg here, what you're basically told is, look, you come into the compensation scheme, we'll cut you a check, you give up your right to sue, you're done. Or you don't come into the compensation scheme, and you sue. But you can't come into the compensation scheme, take our money, hire a lawyer, and sue. Uh, you've got to make some choices. That was, there was an effort to do that early on by TEPCO, that had a clause in the uh, application for compensation that said, by applying and accepting our compensation, you've renounced your right to sue. People got mad. They said, that's not fair. It's too early, et cetera, et cetera. So at this point, you can apply to TEPCO directly, get some money. You can go to ADR, get some money. You can sue. You can do all three at the same time. You could do two out of three. You could do one out of three. It's, it's, it's like the horse races. And, and for a group of individuals, who uh, largely have, you know, the, the, the average amount of sophistication of a member of the public with regard to the legal system, which is not a lot, and limited access to legal professionals, uh, what it is they're required to do, what it is that's responsible to do in terms of achieving compensation uh, remains rather opaque. Uh, I was told to stop before one, so I, I'm a minute over. Let me stop here. I'd love to hear your comments, your suggestions on how to supplement this work, et cetera. So thanks.